It's a rural desert town. We're headed out to actually go to Roswell. With a reputation that's out of this world. We have what is alleged to be a UFO crash with like several bodies inside. It went worldwide, all over the place instantaneously. But 75 years after the infamous cover-up... Why they need these trucks to haul this stuff out if it was just a weather balloon? How much closer are we to understanding what really happened in Roswell? We are fooling ourselves if we don't think that there's something more going on here. We'll meet with eyewitnesses. We started to track unknown aircraft. This isn't just a couple of years ahead. This is like thousands of years ahead. Abductees. The next thing I knew, I couldn't move. The only thing that I kept thinking over and over again was they're here. They're here. And today's top UFO researchers. Astronomers are truly trying to find life in our galaxy. I will bet that in the next 10 years, we will find a planet like our Earth to travel beyond the headlines of this harrowing story. We're here at the back entrance gate, Area 51. What shocking realities have we uncovered about the 1947 incident in New Mexico? All the debris was taken somewhere. Do they want people to know? No, they don't. And how does a recent Pentagon report help to prove the existence of UFOs? The Navy he says these videos are authentic. Still, the question is, what was it? Just look at the evidence. Look at the proof. Come on, guys. There's more than just we don't know what's flying around. You know, the jig is up. People don't like being lied to. People don't like feeling tricked. We deserve to know the truth. miles off the California coast, Petty Officer 3rd Class Gary Voorhees is manning his station on the guided missile cruiser, the USS Princeton. I was an Aegis computer technician and I ran uh, the radar systems and the fire control computer systems. I got to be an expert on how everything was ran. On this particular day, Voorhees and his team have been tasked with testing out the ship's new radar system. We have to make sure all the systems are running properly. You know, get out there and kick the tires is basically what it is. They use the radar to monitor routine flight combat drills. But only a few hours into their surveillance, they spot something very unusual. We started to track unknown aircraft at about 20,000 feet. Uh, they're only doing 100 knots. That's really, really slow for an aircraft at that altitude. They would just keep appearing and they'd disappear, then they'd show up again, and then they'd disappear for a while and show up again. After a few minutes, the blip seemed to disappear for good, leaving the crew to believe there's a glitch in the new system. But shortly after rebooting, the bizarre aircrafts are back, and they continue to appear over the next several days. But at this point, since we can't identify them, through our radar systems or any other means, we have to actually go out and physically look at them, which would mean an, in, an interrogation by one of the F-18s. On November 14, the Navy scrambles three supersonic F-18 fighter jets to do a flyby of the area. One gets close enough to the strange phenomenon to capture this video with its onboard camera. So we, we went through it and we watched it and uh, it blew me away. The craft had like an aura around it. It didn't have any flight surfaces. It didn't have any windows. There was no visible means of any type of propulsion, but yet these things exhibited the ability to go hypersonic speeds. When you watch something that's so incredible, you don't believe that this is anything real. Like, what's the trick? Given their long oval shape, the Navy nicknames the strange aircrafts the Tic Tacs. With the Tic Tacs, the technology was so far beyond anything I could comprehend. This isn't just a couple of years ahead. This is like thousands of years ahead of us. And it just blows your mind. You know, I mean, what in the world could possibly 
fly like these things could. But before Voorhees can dig any deeper, two Navy men in flight suits approach. They actually came on board and took the data recording from the ship. So they have all of the radar data. The onboard camera video also disappears. To this day, eyewitnesses like Gary Voorhees say that only fragments of the original videos have resurfaced. I want to know what happened to all this data. What happened to all the videos? Every single plane up there had some a video going, so there could possibly be multiple videos of the Tic Tacs. So my question is, is why can't we see it? Some believe this is just the latest in a string of government cover-ups used to deny the existence of unidentified flying objects, or UFOs. The UFO was the term that was created in the 1950s from a U.S. Air Force pilot who basically just saw a, a satellite or something that he could not identify. And it was picked up by the media all over the world, and so it kind of stuck. Typically, when we say UFO, we are talking about flying saucers or something maybe extraterrestrial. For more than 75 years, these supernatural vessels have been the stuff of legend, debate, and pop culture. And it all stems from a mysterious incident that took place deep in the New Mexico desert 75 years ago. July 1947, there's a thunderstorm. And a man named Mac Brazel, he's a rancher out at Foster Ranch, which is not exactly in Roswell, but is a little ways away. And he hears a really loud bang. The next day, he goes out onto the land and he sees something incredible. There are about a quarter mile of debris. And this material that the debris was made out of was something that he thought was out of this world. It was so thin and so lightweight. You didn't have to put any effort to pick it up, but yet it was indestructible. You couldn't burn it, you couldn't cut it. Mac Brazel calls the sheriff to say, what should I do with this? Of course, the sheriff tells him, go down and, and call the Army airfield that's over there. They'll know what to do. The Army sends Major Jesse Marcel from the nearby Roswell Army airfield to survey the scene. It doesn't take long for the seasoned officer to realize he's in way over his head. Marcel is shocked enough at what he's saying that he immediately calls the rest of the army and they gather up everything that they can and they haul it away. The following day, the army issues an astounding statement, admitting to their role in removing a flying saucer from the rancher's property. The revelation makes front page news in the local paper. There is a headline in the local Roswell papers after this happened that reads, flying saucer crashes into Roswell Ranch. People are wondering what's going on here. There was a freak out. It went worldwide, all over the place instantaneously. But then what happens next really is what shapes the rest of history. Less than 24 hours later, the Army issues a new statement. This time, they claim the wreckage wasn't a UFO at all, but a weather balloon. And on the front cover of that newspaper is Jesse Marcel holding what looks like a little bit of tinfoil and a couple sticks. This is all that it is. My biggest question would have to be, why did the government acknowledge it and then immediately change their mind? They basically covered it up and it was super evident that they covered it up. With the Cold War underway, and national security of the utmost importance, the American government is not in a position to take any chances. I think it was a knee-jerk reaction. What if our adversaries 
got a hold that there was a crash UFO and used that to create hysteria, it could give our enemies a tactical advantage. The last thing that I think the government wanted to do was admit that we don't have control of our airspace and that things are coming to our planet and we don't know what they are. For nearly 30 years, that's where the Roswell story ends. Until 1978, when Major Jesse Marcel retires and comes forward with a startling confession. He admits that he was told to take that picture and that it was not of this world, the material that he had possessed, not a weather balloon. It was definitely not a weather balloon, and uh, it was an aircraft. So what it could have been, I wouldn't know. He has stated multiple times that is not the debris he had his hands on, and that it was a cover-up. It was not anything from this earth that I'm quite sure of. People did give him a lot of backlash. Aliens aren't real. Jesse, go away. You know, you're crazy. What would be the motivation of Jesse Marcel to lie about this all these years later? Why wouldn't you just, you know, do your job and let the government story live? There's no reward for that. We are fooling ourselves if we don't think that there's something more going on here. Some believe the government wanted to divert attention from an even bigger discovery. Three deceased alien bodies that are rumored to have been among the wreckage. Mortician Glenn Dennis remembered getting some strange calls from the base mortuary officer around the time of the Brazel discovery. He was inquiring about what would be the smallest possible casket that we could get that would be hermetically sealed. And an army nurse who was a close friend of his told him that she had been part of some strange activities going on in the hospital that day. She said, we have three bodies. And she said, I've never been so horrified in my life. I've never seen anything so gruesome in my life. These bodies were described as having bulbous, big, oversized heads in proportion to their body and really big, ominous uh, black eyes with barely a nose or a mouth. Despite first-hand accounts from the mortician and nurse who each claim to encounter the alien bodies, the government offers this explanation. Those bodies were really just dummies, crash test dummies that were misidentified. But what's funny is those uh, were not being used by the military until the 50s. So when you look at the vast witness testimony, it really shares a consistent account of a strange exotic flying saucer crashing and a strange debris being collected, bodies being seen and then being swiftly covered up. But whatever happened at Roswell in 1947, it's not the end of the story. In fact, it's just the beginning. Over the course of the next 75 years, the search for what really took place in the New Mexico desert that fateful night has uncovered new revelations. And they are far stranger than anyone could have ever imagined. Since 1947, the search for the truth about alien life has brought thousands of visitors to Roswell, New Mexico every year. Everybody is paying attention to this little, you know, rural uh, area. People are wondering what's going on here. But it wasn't until 50 years after the controversial UFO crash that the public received their first promise of proof. In the summer, of 1995, the alien autopsy documentary aired on Fox. It is very bizarre. Do we really have this type of videotape of alien beings being operated on? The 17-minute program claimed to reveal footage from the secret medical exam of an alien found at the Roswell crash site, supplied by a retired military cameraman. People still debate it to this day whether or not it's real, or whether or not there's some sort of hoax involved. I wanted to know if it was real. 
In 2016, UFO enthusiast Emmett Hayes and his brother Joe launched a podcast and YouTube channel to dive deeper into all things extraterrestrial. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Emmett. I'm Joe. And we are the UFO Bros. Bros! Back then, nobody talked about aliens, UFOs, nothing like that. We wanted to know what people's experience was with UFOs, if there's anybody still out there that was still interested in UFOs. That's what led the bros to begin making UFO hunting missions they affectionately call night watches. And one of their first stops was the legendary town of Roswell. We just decided, you know what? Let's for once actually go to the places that we've read so much about. We're at the gate that uh, gives access to the Roswell crash right behind us. We knew that this is probably where it all originated from. The center of this whole phenomenon that was happening you're not supposed to be able to be back here, but we are. And we're going out. All right, you guys, I think that we're here. We see something, but it's kind of turning around. Bro, we're here. We're here, that's freaking it, man. I found the crash site, and found the monument. Tell them they were there and what they found. In the years since the 1947 incident, Countless visitors have attempted to find evidence of debris at the crash site. And in 2004, an exciting discovery was finally made. A stone was found near Roswell, and it has specific magnetic qualities. When held near a magnet, the stone reportedly spins on its own. It also features strange carvings that many believe could be a secret alien code. We don't know if this was part of the craft inside, outside, or anything at this point. It was the one thing possibly left over from the crash. But to this day, nothing like the substance found by Major Jesse Marcel has ever been recovered. Anything? Nothing yet. <gasps> I believe that all the debris was taken somewhere. They take it to these, these, these bases or these hidden places to where they can figure out exactly what they're seeing and putting together piece by piece and building as they go. So what better place to do it is in Area 51. 148 miles northwest of Las Vegas, Area 51 is a remote military base where many believe the government has been doing top secret research into alien technology since the 1950s. And we're here at the back entrance gate to Area 51, and uh, they got eyes on us. Looks like a two-eyed camera following us uh, on each side of the road. It said that there are multiple underground levels, some levels that where we have extraterrestrials, and there have been documentation of uh, aerial phenomena happening over the base. It's in a disclosed place out there in the middle of nowhere, of course. Um, they have a little highway out there called extraterrestrial highway that'll take you to it. Of course, you can only go to a certain point, and that's it. You gotta stop. You can't even set foot near it without somebody catching you. We just want to know what is going on here. Why is this so secret? Why is there a guard, you know, five miles away from the base? Shrouded in secrecy, this government research facility may have never been on the public's radar if it weren't for the startling 1989 claims of one man, Bob Lazar. Bob Lazar was the nuclear physicist who actually worked at Area 51, who was the first one to uh, blow the whistle and to actually come out and say what was going on there. 1989, he comes out to a news reporter with some incredible claims that he worked at Los Alamos Laboratory as a nuclear physicist, but also that he worked in an area called S4, which is just south of Area 51. This base was located in the side of a mountain. There were hangar doors that were textured to look like sand so that it could not be seen from up above. He said there were about uh, nine craft uh, being examined there during the years that he was there. These aircrafts, he says, aren't like anything the seasoned scientist has ever seen before. You can see about three quarters of the edge of the craft. It was a typical flying saucer. It was uh, 
I say typical, I mean, like anything you'd see in a cartoon. It was this very metallic, smooth, silvery disc. What Bob Lazar said he saw in those hangars is remarkable. Different UFOs. Some damaged, some fully intact and fully operational. Crafts from another world. Human hands did not put this together. Um, the technology was far beyond anything that we had. Bob Lazar became concerned with the fact that he was involved in such a high and in secretive project. And he talked about what it was that he did, which was reverse engineering a high power engine that allowed the craft to fly at great speeds. And his most alarming finding? that this craft is made up of a mysterious element that does not exist anywhere in nature. It was an extremely bizarre metal uh, that somehow powers the propulsion system. That seems to be connected to what was seen at Roswell. According to Lazar, the 1947 crash could have been what first brought this material down to Earth. When Bob Lazar came out and gave all the details of what was going on at Area 51, People just said, no, none of it exists, nothing, none of it is real. But to those UFO experts familiar with Roswell, the pushback on Lazar's claims is yet another example of a government cover-up. Bob Lazar was a government employee saying that the government is lying to you about what they're doing. And the government did everything in their power to make Bob Lazar look like he was crazy. They literally tried to wipe him away and say he didn't even work there. First thing to go was my birth certificate. That vanished without a trace. A news reporter tries to do his due diligence in this, these claims and try to verify his story. So he goes to Los Alamos laboratory and asks them, can you verify that Bob Lazar worked here? Can I get some information? No, we don't have any record of him. But when the reporter is able to get his hands on a company directory, he finds an alarming contradiction. If it wasn't for that one little piece of information that proved that he was in the telephone directory on base, they may have gotten away with it. In the three decades since Bob Lazar's controversial testimony, a startling truth has emerged. Fast forward to 2013, the government does acknowledge Area 51 as an actual base. Somebody actually admitted that this place does exist. Now we can dig a little deeper. As researchers have taken a closer look at some of Bob Lazar's other claims, time and again, they've proven to exist in the technology of today. We know element 115 is indeed real. It is now on the periodic table as muscovium. Scientists weren't able to synthesize it until early 2000s. The way the propulsion system worked and how the ship moved, it's only grown in evidence over the years. Other physicists have cooperated his story saying that this man knows what he's talking about. So could this mean that the Roswell crash was the catalyst for the technology leap of the last century? If you just look at the statistics of us progressing uh, technology-wise as a species, there is a very big spike right after Roswell. That same year, the transistor was invented, followed soon after by fiber optics, lasers, night vision, microprocessors, all technology that some believe the U.S. was at least 200 years away from developing on our own. How did we get this technology if we didn't have it before? And how did we evolve that quick? I think a lot of people these days are thinking what they cannot explain must be extraterrestrials. But was Roswell truly the beginning of alien contact on Earth? Some say there are signs that these encounters came much sooner and are still impacting our planet to this day. Six decades after the controversial crash in Roswell, New Mexico, the U.S. government has finally acknowledged the existence of a secret research facility known as Area 51. Boom, 2013, we get the document. It's real. Can you imagine? Still, 
what they are researching remains a source of constant speculation. There are a lot of conspiracies that surround Area 51, particularly because of Bob Lazar's claims of there being back-engineered alien technology there. There was kind of a spiral of people then saying, then are there actual aliens there? Showing us their technology and that's kind of how our technology has grown since then. But how far back can we trace the influence of extraterrestrial technology? Many UFO researchers believe alien contact was made well before Roswell. So with the things that we find in archaeological digs and petroglyphs, hieroglyphs, geoglyphs, there's some things that point to a different aspect of unearthly beings coming down here and kind of helping us push forward a little bit. When we start to look back, we see things like the pyramids or these big giant cathedrals and you look at the technology that these civilizations had, things aren't adding up. I definitely believe that these alien beings probably did build many of the recorded wonders across the earth. How did they do this? How did they figure all these things out? It's questions like these that have fueled the interests of UFO researchers all across the country, including Texas-based researcher Jane Kyle, better known as UFO Jane. My mother did not expect that I would grow up to be a UFO researcher. I didn't know that that was a job when I was a kid. But it wasn't until college that Jane's explorations into the unknown really took off. I had a journalism degree from the University of Texas at Austin. At the time, I had been doing some different writing. And so, what do you know? I started writing about UFOs. And I discovered that not only were UFOs real, that they were in Texas and being seen all, all over the states. Jane set up a website where she began to document all of these encounters. It wasn't long before people reached out with reports of their own. And then I felt, oh, well, I have an obligation now. I have a duty to bring these cases forward. And so the rest is really history. There are so many cases that people may not be aware of one case that really has always struck me is the Cash Landrum incident. There's two women and uh, one of their grandsons are driving through the Piney Woods and they see an object just hovering there in the sky. And, and they know, okay, that's weird. When the women get out of the car, they feel a blast of intense heat and spot a group of military helicopters hovering nearby. The women get back into their car. They actually proceeded to experience symptoms that are very similar to radiation uh, sickness, blisters on their hands, uh, nausea, hair falling out, and all of that. Believing that the symptoms are a result of being so close to the intense heat of this supernatural aircraft, the women blamed the military forces that were present that day for not doing a better job of securing the hazardous area. They tried to sue uh, the U.S. government for knowledge of this object and to try to get uh, their medical bills paid for. But the U.S. government claims to have no idea what these women are talking about. Vicki Landrum and Betty Cash felt like they were being ignored or uh, even intimidated. Can we shine some new light and truth and justice on these cases from the past? For most, that day won't come until there is enough visual evidence to undeniably prove the existence of UFOs. And so to the people who say, you know, where are the photos, where are the videos? Well, I mean, look at the Phoenix Lights incident. March 13th, 1997. 
something bizarre is happening in the skies over Phoenix, Arizona. Thousands of people saw strange anomalous lights look to be solid color objects possibly connected glide right over Phoenix. It was a huge triangle or delta shaped object. So big, we're talking football field sizes. Huge with lights underneath floating silently across the valley. The only noise that came from the Phoenix Lights vehicle was just a very low, almost imperceptible hum. That was it. People said that they could probably throw a tennis ball up and it would hit this craft, that it was dark and shimmery, and that it blacked out the sky. Residents from Arizona to Nevada to the Mexican state of Sonora witnessed the phenomenon. But more importantly, they also capture proof. There were multiple photos, videos, hundreds of eyewitness accounts that were actually reported that night. It was happening in real time. And it was amazing. I remember I wanted to just jump into the car and drive to Phoenix and witness it myself. Before anyone can get to the bottom of what's happening, the US Air Force issues an official explanation. They said they were doing a training exercise, Operation Snowbird, and that they were dropping flares. Researchers have done a lot of work into it. They didn't fall into any category of what we would be able to classify them as flares or any other thing, not drones. They did appear to be unknown. There were two sets of lights. The first sets of lights is what people described as the giant craft. So some people question, did the government come in and drop flares right after to throw everybody off? I think so. And that's where the story ends. Until two years later, when the anniversary of the incident puts the Phoenix lights back in the news and attracts the attention of movie star and pilot Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell and Goldie were sitting in their living room and the news came on and the newsman was talking about how a pilot had called in to report these UFOs. And I'm watching this and I f- I'm feeling like uh, Richard Dreyfuss mm-hmm. in, in uh, <laughs> Close Encounters of the Third Count. It's like, why, why do I know this, you know? In that moment, Kurt Russell realized that he was the pilot who had reported the Phoenix Lights. He had gotten in his plane, went up there with his son, wrote inside of his notebook about it. Kurt called flight control to report the sighting. But the strange thing is, he had completely forgotten all about it until now. So I went to my logbooks, and there was the flight at that time, and I didn't mention anything about the UFO. The fascinating part of that to me is that it would just went literally out of my head. It was like it didn't happen. You know, he saw it, he reported it, just left his memory. And, you know, that's not something that's unique to the Phoenix Lights. That is something we see again and again with some of the more disturbing or fascinating cases this pattern of missing time. So maybe there was some kind of electromagnetic effect or or something, you know, as this craft uh, passed over. To this day, the Phoenix Lights remain a mystery to all who witness them. But it's not just UFO investigators trying to determine what was in the sky that night. Despite their denials, so is the U.S. government. 50 years before the Phoenix Lights were written off as flares used by the military in a routine training exercise, the feds were telling people an alien substance found in Roswell, New Mexico was merely a torn weather balloon. That is a far cry from a disc (laughs) with metal everywhere. It's a huge difference. A flying saucer crashed on a ranch in Roswell. That story's been so covered up and buried. 
While the government refuses to engage in UFO speculation publicly at the time, privately, they're working as hard as anyone to get to the bottom of these strange phenomena. All of the UFO programs that they've opened, Project Sign, Project Grudge. I think the biggest, most well-known project was Project Blue Book. Headquartered at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, this government study first launched months after the Roswell incident. This was a really intense time. You know, World War II ending and, and the beginning of, of the Cold War. We didn't have extra money or time to be worried about space aliens unless we were really worried about space aliens. About six months after Roswell, an Army general, Nathan Twining, had actually released a memo, and he was telling the government that UFOs needed to be taken seriously, and it's not fictitious. According to General Twining, an investigation into UFOs is a matter of national security. So, does the government get involved? Yes, they do. Do they want people to know? No, they don't. Setting the tone for this new study, the government employs Dr. J. Allen Hynek, a scientist, astronomer, and legendary skeptic to oversee Project Blue Book. The intention was really to explain it away and just keep it under wraps. But as Hynek and his team spend the next few years looking into UFO reports across the country, their efforts yield surprising results. They investigated over 12,000 of these stories inside Project Blue Book, and 701 of them ended up coming back as unidentified. When we think about are we alone in the universe, and we have maybe 700 uh, examples of pieces of evidence that could say, uh, no, we're not alone. That's, I mean, we're not talking about one random light that was seen uh, by uh, your uncle. Now, I have many photographs that I cannot declare fakes. It's not a meteor, it's not a star, it's not a helicopter, it's not an airplane in the sky. What is it? Heineck realized that, wow, this is not an anomaly, this is not one witness, this is a pattern, this is a phenomenon. By the end of his time at Project Blue Book, the legendary skeptic begins seeing UFOs in a new light. He disproved everything so hard to the point where when he couldn't come to any other conclusion, he's then faced with the fact that it was something he didn't know. What ended up happening is he became a believer. Despite Dr. Hynek's findings, in late 1969, Project Blue Book shuts down. Well, they needed somebody to fund these projects. Where are they going to get these funds from? It opens, they investigate, then it's closed. And they've done this quite a few times now. So I think we have to ask ourselves, what is going on here? What people will tell you that aren't believers is that, oh no, they looked into it and they didn't find anything and it's closed. I really do think that there is a much deeper group of people that have always been looking into this. Sousa's interest in UFOs began well before the FBI. It all started with a strange encounter when he was just eight years old. I was in New York City with my parents. We were at a, a wedding party and uh, I got together with a bunch of other little kids and we ran running out into the night. One of the kids got kind of rough, hit me in the stomach. I fell down on the sidewalk. All the kids said, oh my God, he's hurt. What should we do? So they all ran back to the building and left me there. So I was out there in the middle of the night and I started looking up between two tall buildings. It's then D'Souza sees a mysterious shape like a big black ink cloud blotting out the stars. I could see little tendrils coming out of it. And then from the bottom of the black ink cloud, I started seeing lights coming out. And it was this metallic disc, probably about 60 feet in diameter. And it was just coming down over my head. I just stood there and then 
uh, two young ladies appeared on my left and they were looking up at the same thing and they yelled at me, hey little boy, you better run home. I think the world might be ending. I stepped out of that spotlight and then the thing reversed course, started going back up. I looked over for those two girls and they were gone. I don't know if they were gone with the craft or if they just ran faster than anything I've ever seen in my life because they were nowhere. In the decades since this encounter, D'Souza's wondered what exactly he and those girls witnessed. It wasn't until he joined the FBI that he got some idea. We had some uh, contractors that were disappearing at this military base. And so we were called over there and the uh, base commander said something about there's a lot of sightings of UFOs and things like that. And he doesn't know if there's anything to do with the disappearances. But for D'Souza, these stories are enough to confirm what he's always believed, that UFOs have made contact with humans. That night, he and his partner head out to the base for a closer look. It's then that D'Souza experiences something extraordinary. It looked like a classic UFO, and the lights were so bright, you couldn't even distinguish the craft itself. And it just came down over us, and my partner and I just dove for the ground because it came down so low over us. And then it just disappeared. Moments later, D'Souza and his partner are approached by two men. It was all these guys just dressed in black, and they brought me back to the base for questioning about why did the UFO come to me specifically? Like they were thinking it came to me specifically. After hours of intense questioning, the men finally let D'Souza go. Sworn to secrecy, D'Souza never files a report or shares the details about where exactly he was that day. But even now, he wonders why the UFO could have been coming for him and how much more those men in black might have known. The concept of other beings living on our planet does not frighten me at all. What frightens me is that people don't accept this reality that we're living through right now, that we have other species that actually occupy this planet with us. Agent D'Souza believes that ever since Roswell, our government has been hiding the truth about aliens and UFOs. They all know what they can say and what they have to cover up immediately. That's been going on forever. But what will it take for the truth to finally come out? For the army of true believers, it starts with making a lot of noise. There are thousands of people in the world that are abductees that do remember those things happening to them. Guys like me, they held that secret for so long. They need to be heard. We've got proof. Oh my God, this is incredible. In the decades since the alleged UFO crash at Roswell, more and more people claim they've seen unidentified aerial phenomena, or UAPs. You can call it whatever you want. This phenomenon needs to be studied and taken very, very serious because it literally could be the make or break of our civilization. But there's a risk in telling those stories. You know, you lose friends, family, you know, they think you're crazy. It's one thing to watch X-Files and wish that you'd see something cool. But when you're in a situation to know without a shadow of a doubt that there absolutely is unknown aircraft, it's a burden. Podcast hosts Brianna Matz and Jamie Billings have made it their mission to take the stigma out of seeing and believing in UFOs. It's the hardest thing, actually because you're living in a world that's telling you that it's not real and it's not happening. What really makes people feel better is when they're able to tell their story and people do not dismiss what it is they're saying. We decided what our podcast would be would be a place to form a community where people can openly talk about UFOs and aliens. We have our first call-in. I go to sleep. I wake up 
consciously can't move my body and I'm I am levitating off of my bed no. and I just remember like being terrified. There are thousands of people in the world that are abductees that do remember those things happening to them and it's extremely traumatic. They don't have a lot of support. They're not accepted in society. The podcast hosts both speak from personal experience. For Jamie, it started like so many close encounters with a beam of light in the sky. I was on my way home one night after visiting family and it was probably about two o'clock in the morning. I had seen this light just kind of come down and I was like, wow, that's an interesting light. And so I started to look at the sky and the more and more I looked at it, the more and more I started to notice it looked like something was flying. I drove home, and at the time, I lived on a four-story walk-up, so I drove, walked all the way to the top. And I looked out my window, and there it was, parked on top of this building. It was, oh my god, what am I looking at, and why does it seem like it's looking right back at me? Terrified, Jamie locks herself in a closet, and that's the last thing she remembers. I woke up the next morning in bed in a completely different pair of clothes than I was sitting in the closet in, and I have no recollection of what happened or how I got to bed. Strangely enough, it was around that same time that a 17-year-old Brianna was lying in her bed when the night also took a sudden turn. I was watching TV, and then the next thing I knew, I couldn't move. And the only thing that I kept thinking over and over again in my head, like a tape that just kept playing over and over, was they're here, they're here, they're coming, they're here. The next thing Brianna remembers is waking up without any idea of how much time had passed. The only thing I could remember was a visual of being at my window. And for some reason, I thought there was a helicopter outside my window. And that led me completely dumbfounded. And then that kind of led me a little bit down in the rabbit hole. Why did I keep saying they? They're here, they're coming. They've always been here. Who are they? And that question really took over my life for a long time. As Brianna started researching UFOs, memories suddenly came flashing back to her. Every single night, I was having dreams of being on a craft, of being in a craft where there's no gravity. I'd wake up the next day and be like, am, am I what's real, what's not kind of thing? And then I just started having more and more kind of abduction-like scenarios in my dreams. For years, neither Brianna nor Jamie talked about their bizarre experiences. Until one night when the two are together watching a TV show about aliens. It was through watching these programs she ended up telling me that she also had an experience with a UFO or with aliens. and. It immediately triggered me. And then as we were talking, we realized that we both had experiences within weeks of each other. But how far back has memory lapse been associated with alien encounters? Some say it all started in 1961 with the alarming case of Betty and Barney Hill. Betty and Barney Hill is probably one of the first abduction stories that people can think of. Back in the old days, the UFOs used to come in and land in this field. They were just driving along the uh, New Hampshire-Massachusetts border on the old 66, and they suddenly noticed that they were being trailed by an unnatural light in the sky that was getting closer and closer to them. At the time, they don't know it's a UFO, it's just this bright light. Barney pulls over to the side of the road, looks at it, and, and he just kind of freaks out. So when they get down this road to make a turnoff, lo and behold, these alien beings are standing right there with their craft sitting down. According to the Hills, the next thing they know, they're being abducted. 
they were taken aboard a ship, extraterrestrial ship, being shown around a little bit, and then being terrorized by experiments uh, and uh, probing and things like that. Betty says that she was fully coherent of what exactly happened. Barney was in a trance state. While aboard the ship, Betty Hill saw a star map. It's supposed to be where these beings are from. It's really amazing bit of evidence, proof that she was able to provide later on. At the time, however, Betty and Barney Hill couldn't remember any of this. According to their account, they found themselves at home later that night, but they could tell something was wrong. They realize that they have a huge chunk of missing time. Betty's clothes are on wrong. She has a weird substance on her dress. Betty's dress, they have all those pictures where there were like holes and stains in her dress that weren't there before. It's only after the Hills go to a hypnotherapist that they're able to uncover their memories from that night. The couple were separated and both received a regression hypnosis. And they were able to talk about being taken aboard a craft, having examinations done to them. This was probably the first abduction case where good quality hypnosis was used to bring out all the real memories of what happened. UAPs and UFOs, what it really does to the human is it challenges your reality. It pushes you into accepting things outside of the norm. Lori McDonald is a hypnotherapist and member of MUFON, a nonprofit made up of volunteers who study UFOs. She specializes in working with people who claim they've been abducted. Through all the stories she's heard, there's one thing she and other experts believe people get wrong about aliens. Just because they're creating fear and trauma doesn't make them evil. That's our reaction. What they're doing is inappropriate. It's violating our human rights, but it's not evil. I don't think they mean us any harm. I think that they are technologically advanced to the point that if they intended to harm us, they would have done so by now. And they haven't done it yet, so I think we're, we're good there. But what is the motivation behind all these alien visits? When it comes to the crash 75 years ago in Roswell, New Mexico, some experts think they have the answer. Just two years before the Roswell UFO incident, and a little more than 100 miles away, some believe we first summoned aliens with the monumental event that took place in Alamogordo, New Mexico on July 16, 1945. This was the first atomic bomb was detonated. And we don't think that's gonna get someone else's attention out there in the universe. And Roswell was the only base in the world that held nuclear weapons at the time. Why are we seeing so many UFOs around our nuclear weapons? Some people say, though, because they could be checking us out, because that's our most powerful weapon that we have. This need to keep an eye on America's nuclear weapons is what many UFO experts believe drove extraterrestrials to a Roswell airfield on that fateful night in 1947. There's some speculation that these UFOs just suddenly showed up over a military base that in some cases, no one knew that base had nuclear weapons. It was a top secret. And yet, these UFOs knew somehow. Air Force veteran Jeremy McGowan buys that explanation because in 1995, he witnessed something similar. To this day, I still have absolutely no idea what it was that I saw. It all started when McGowan was deployed to Jordan without any explanation. When we landed, it was, it was a different feeling than every other deployment that I've ever been on. There was a lot of people that I didn't have any idea who they were. I'm seeing guys from Naval Special Warfare, the 101st Airborne, FBI, CIA folks, and then 
It really got me when I saw the guys from the DOE, the Department of Energy. To his surprise, McGowan's assignment is far away from the fray. The only thing that was there was a very large desert-colored tent and a very large wooden crate just sitting out there in the middle of the desert. There was no markings, there was no labels, serial numbers, no nothing. The captain said, okay, this is where you're gonna be for the next few days. His orders, watch the crate, protect the crate. Don't let anyone near the crate. Hey, there's nobody here. We're in the middle of the desert in Jordan. I can see to the horizon. There's, there's nobody around. He's like, well, just don't let anybody near the crate. I was like, okay, that's great. But what happens if somebody gets near the crate? Shoot them. Well, it's obviously no longer an exercise. But after two days of watching the crate without any idea of its contents, McGowan's attention is pulled to an even greater anomaly. There was this one particular night when I was just absolutely in awe of the stars that I was seeing. You could see the edge of the Milky Way galaxy and just, it's absolutely beautiful. So I pulled out my night vision goggles and then I saw something that can only be described as, as a bright point of light. I was seeing this thing shoot from my six o'clock, travels straight directly above me, executes a, a perfect right angle turn, and shoots off to my nine o'clock in under two seconds. It didn't slow down. It just changed direction. And then it did it again and again. It's a phenomenon not unlike what others have described witnessing. But for an Air Force officer with a strong familiarity of flying objects, it's an especially baffling experience. I can absolutely tell you it was not an aircraft. I can absolutely tell you it was not a satellite. I cannot tell you what it was um, because I don't know. I was never a UFO guy. And that one day was kind of the genesis for everything that has occurred since then. McGowan knew that if he told anyone about what he experienced, they'd never believe him. So as soon as he returned home, he set out to find proof. That's, that's when I took my, my family car and uh, I just started drilling holes in the roof and mounting cameras and spectrum analyzers and things like that to the vehicle. I ended up calling the vehicle the OSIRIS, which stands for Off-Road Scientific Investigation Response Informatics System. McGowan uses this vehicle to drive around and collect research from the sky to be able to catalog and analyze what is a bug, what is a bird, what is a plane. We need a standardization in data collection to find the answers that we were all looking for. I think it's safe to say that today, I probably have close to the same amount of equipment in my vehicle that the US government had 30 years ago when they were recording uh, and capturing data on UAP. McGowan won't stop collecting data until he's proven there are objects in our atmosphere beyond scientific understanding. If I can capture data that shows that we're not alone, it changes everything. If I can't capture that data, it's because of one of two reasons. Either one, they don't exist. Or two, my equipment isn't good enough yet. But our government does have the technology, and it may already have proof of alien visitors. Ever since the widely debated crash in Roswell, people all over the country have been searching for evidence that UFOs exist. 70 years later, in October 2017, it's America's tiniest island that brings the most promising lead yet. 
a Hawaiian observatory tracked a very strange space object that just captured the attention of astronomers and scientists around the globe. It was a big giant object. It was moving very quickly, too quickly to be an asteroid. It was like nothing they had ever seen before. It had a strange reddish color, which is not what we would expect and might be typical of metal. So material that we weren't expecting. Scientists watch in awe as the giant object hurtles through Earth's orbit at a cool 57,000 miles an hour. It also had a very incredibly interesting flight path because it came by us and then did a U-turn and slingshotted itself right back into the universe. It was just here and then gone, and we had a very limited you know, window of time to measure it and study it. But as brief as its appearance is, the important thing is that it was recorded which has allowed scientists the time to determine that this object isn't just out of this world. It most likely came from out of our solar system. We quickly found out from analyzing the orbit that it was an object that was not in orbit around the sun, but was basically coming from another planetary system. It was named Oumuamua because it was discovered in Maui, Hawaii. And a muamua meant a messenger from afar that came first. But what exactly the object is remains a mystery. Right now, there is multiple explanations. One of them is that this is a fragment of a planet, and that's why it has this kind of weird shape that was fragmented. Some scientists believe that a muamua is more than a rock. It may be a vessel transporting alien life forms. Scientist Avi Loeb, very well revered, came out with a really provocative theory that this is essentially a passing spaceship. And his fellow scientists didn't 100% disagree with him. So the fact that scientists couldn't rule that out is really amazing. And the enthusiasm only continues when an earth-shattering article is published just a few months later. So in December 2017, we learned from the New York Times that the government had been investigating UFOs. This program that had been investigating UFOs was ATIP. And that is the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. According to the report, long after the government terminated their investigation into UFOs with Project Blue Book in 1969, they started funding another top secret program, launched in 2007 by Nevada Senator Harry Reid. The story goes that astronaut John Glenn had a conversation with the Senator Reed about his own interest in UFOs. And I think when an astronaut <laughs> tells you that, wow, we need to look into UFOs, maybe you start looking into UFOs. So we're in a different place now where the government says, yes, we've been looking at UFOs. Yes, they're real. We don't know what they are. Could they be extraterrestrial? Absolutely. Funded with $22 million of the Defense Department's annual budget, this top secret program carried on for five years without the public having any idea it even existed. We got programs being dictated, millions of dollars, military forces. You know, we asked our kids, you know, where are you spending their, your, your alliance on? And they got to give you detailed reports. Taxpayers need to know where your money is going. According to Senator Reid, the choice to keep the program confidential was a matter of national security because they were studying unidentified objects that have come in contact with military aircraft. But, the Times reports, the program supervisor recently resigned, and three of these videos have now been released to the public. Yeah. Wow. Oh, 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 oh. Look at the 
one of which is the Tic Tac encounter Naval Petty Officer 3rd Class Gary Voorhees witnessed in 2004. All of a sudden, you know, 15 years later, the stigma was lifted when that article came out. It made me feel a lot better. I just kept a secret for so long. The Tic Tac video, you know, that video just opened up everything. It kind of took the world by storm. This particular event is so significant because it's the very first time that the government's admitted that this is an actual thing, that this is an unknown aircraft, and that the event was absolutely real. The New York Times also unveils what's known as the Gimbal Video, whose footage captures another Tic Tac sighting. This one, 11 years later, off the coast of Florida in 2015. They also had UAP in the area, and they interrogated, and the same thing happened. Now, these ships were of a different type than the ones that we encountered. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. My gosh. You see the craft flying in the sky, and it has no wings, no tail, no propulsion, nothing. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots from the west. Oh, yeah, thing, dude. The trajectory, it was calculated about 46,000 miles per hour that this thing moved. Well, if there's like Ooh. a thing, it's rotating. When you see it on film, it looks like something out of a sci-fi video. We don't have that kind of technology. There's no way. The New York Times report marks a huge turning point in the nation's seven-decade investigation into UFOs. The stockpile of evidence and revelations that came out. We look at the whole timeline of disclosure in UFO history, December 2017. I mean, it might be right there with Roswell 1947 as far as its significance. What's even more promising is that the government makes no attempts to deny the New York Times report. When the government came out, finally, and they said, yeah, this is what we did, this is what we're doing. That was, that was good for us. So we get a one, they get a zero, and that one. But for years, the actual findings that this program uncovered remain hidden from the public. Naturally, you wanna know what's next, okay? Are there longer videos? Are there more videos? Are there more witnesses? Are there other objects besides the Tic Tac UFO we've all come to know and love? What else, you know, are we not hearing about? Bring it to us and let us see it. It's our right. They don't and shouldn't own the information. Still, some are more skeptical than excited by the news. I don't think that we can trust anything that comes from the government because we know that they lied for the last 70 years. Why are they all of a sudden now telling the truth? People are curious and the fact that the government covers it up is frustrating. People don't like being lied to. People don't like feeling tricked. We deserve to know the truth. But the truth may be closer than we think. As the number of UFO sightings only continues to rise, some UFO researchers believe aliens aren't just visiting this planet. They may be living here full time. In the years since a 2017 bombshell report revealed the U.S. government has been secretly investigating UFOs, discussions of this once taboo topic have reached some of the highest U.S. institutions. So UFOs went from something that was a fringe topic that a late night show host would joke about into a serious New York Times investigation with uh, credible you know, military witnesses and Congress people even to back it up. You have presidents like Barack Obama talking about the subject matter. There's footage and records of objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. That's great, you know, because when they admit something like that, that just means, hey, we're good, we were right to hold, you know, we, we knew about it. We just wanted to make sure that y'all said it. Still, by 2019, the actual findings of the government-funded program had yet to be released. 
leaving Tic Tac eyewitnesses like Gary Voorhees to try to make sense of the strange encounters on their own. I internalized. I wasn't trying to tell the world about it. I, I became laser focused on trying to figure out what it was and how it worked. And then I get a call from a shipmate of mine, Kevin Day, saying, you want to go find answers? Radar operator Kevin Day was also aboard the USS Princeton in November 2004. And after years of battling the stigma that comes with being a UFO eyewitness, these former military men were determined to bring some scientific backing to their supernatural experiences. We were able to get a very good team of scientists, expats, engineers together, and that's when UAPX was created. Founded in 2019, UAPX, or Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Expeditions, is a nonprofit organization that sets out to collect data on the unknown sites filling our night skies. Knowledge is power. You need to be able to collect as much data about an unknown as possible. Bro, look at that. To know what we're dealing with, I mean, Flight speeds, characteristics, how does it move? How can it stay in the air with no wings? At this point, I'm tired of asking the government. It's our job to identify everything in the air. With data confiscated from the Tic Tac incident back in 2004 still unaccounted for, Gary and his team are working tirelessly to build up a database of their own. We use everything from forward-looking infrared, RF frequency analyzing, ultraviolet light, to make enough correlative data to prove, without a shadow of a doubt, rock hard proof that UAP are real. We've definitely made head over head strides in our research. We're starting to gather some great data that we'll be able to start rivaling what the, what the US government has. So far, Gary and his team have concentrated their research on areas known to be UFO hotspots places like Sedona, places like uh, here in Roswell, you know, where constantly people are always seeing it. But I've got a sneaking suspicion that it doesn't really matter where you are, that if you look up and long enough, you're gonna see something. They're around a whole lot more than we even know. The rising number of UFO sightings across the country has led some researchers to seek out an explanation. There's two parts of it, right? What is in our skies today? And then what has been in our skies in the past? And how has that interacted with us and influenced our history? The quest for answers always leads back to one place, Roswell. In the Roswell situation, you think about all of the war that was taking place. We became a threat to ourselves. I think that ET started to show up more often to kind of uh, monitor what our activities were. And I have often wondered if the craft at the Roswell site was shot down. There was very good possibility that the military knew that these UFOs were going to be in the vicinity. We see that there are hot spots. Uh, they come at the same time, same nights. But was this the start of a war between humans and aliens? Or the beginning of a powerful partnership? Seven years after the Roswell encounter, some believe the American government may have summoned aliens to another New Mexico military base, less than 100 miles away. At Holloman Air Force Base, we were said to have had actual contact where we saw the ships come down and the beings come out and communicate with us. Witnesses to this encounter claimed the extraterrestrial beings were there to meet with one man, America's 34th president, Dwight D. Eisenhower. There is speculation that there was an agreement with uh, former president Dwight Eisenhower uh, with non-human entities. The agreement was made in 1947 to trade human bodies for alien technology. If aliens are responsible for all the technological advances we've enjoyed in the last half a century, 
Some believe it required the government to offer up 250,000 humans for testing. Some people seem to believe that they have extraterrestrial implants in their body. They may have a scoop mark, they may have bruises in areas that you wouldn't normally have. The aliens may be more advanced than us and treat us the same way we treat sheep, cattle, wildlife. Tracked, implanted, and tagged. If there is a strand of 250,000 humans who were hand-selected for alien testing, researchers at MUFON say that might help to explain why many abductees seem to share similar characteristics. We do see that there are some commonalities among the experiencers. And it does look like a blood type. On the couple of thousand cases that I've worked, we have an RH negative blood type. We have a high percentage of military connection. And we believe they've continued to abduct not only those original 250,000, but the offspring of them as well which makes it all the more important that the public knows what's happening and how to stop it. It could be that the, the ETs wanted to create humans to serve them. You know, it really does come down to power. You can actually tell them, no, they have no right touching you. Uh, they do have to comply. Experiencers generally can't even think to say no because they're terrified. But as much as we are still learning about why aliens have interest in our people and our planet, the biggest question is, where did these beings come from in the first place? The scientists at NASA's SETI Institute are leading the charge for answers. The SETI Institute is searching for any type of life in the universe, microbiological life uh, to technological life. We know that statistically speaking, that life outside of Earth has to exist, and intelligent life has to exist. Here at their lab in Mountain View, California, the Institute's 100 scientists use a multi-prong approach to finding other life forms. There is three paths to find life uh, in our universe. One, the most famous one, is to search for techno-signatures. So we use a large array of antennas to uh, listen to the cosmos to see if there is any signatures of technology of alien civilizations. The second way is by developing uh, instruments that will visit planets around us, places that could have life or still have life, we think. And then the third way is, the, is to search for exoplanets. So those are planets in orbit around other stars. There is 400 billion stars in our galaxy, and we know that each star has two planets in average around them. And we know that 30% of those planets could be habitable. Astronomers are truly trying to find life in our galaxy, and I will bet that in the next 10 years, we will find a planet like, uh, like our Earth. It's this promise of life on other planets that continues to fuel the interest of UFO researchers across the world. I believe that people will say, you know, in the future that we're not alone. They'll actually start believing that these things that are out there that we just don't understand. But even as excitement for the future of UFO research grows, there are still so many questions about the incident at the heart of it all. Now, after nearly 75 years of subterfuge, could the U.S. government finally be ready to tell us the truth about Roswell? Recent years have brought astounding revelations about the existence of UFOs. But there's still one question that remains on the minds of skeptics and believers alike. What happened on that ranch in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947? The government knows the truth. And that's why we got to press them. 
We got to get that information from them because I think the needle is moving. Now, 75 years later, the truth may finally be within our reach. Four years after the New York Times outed the U.S. government's top secret advanced aerospace threat identification program, the Pentagon finally releases their findings in June 2021. The report cites 144 cases of unidentified flying objects spotted from 2004 to 2021. They went and did this report to our Congress that said we studied a bunch of stuff. One of them makes sense to us, but all this other stuff, we have absolutely no idea what's going on here. And now we're going to go investigate it. Even more amazing than the 143 unexplained cases is that almost all the cases were reported by witnesses from the U.S. Navy. The reality of it is definitely given greater credibility. Now American military personnel are being allowed to talk about it. Now the entire world understands that this is a real thing. You know, so hopefully, you know, they'll start taking it serious and we can start getting more real scientists and real endeavors in trying to figure out what these things are. But when it comes to the event that started it all, UFO enthusiasts say it's not so much about what crashed in Roswell, but who brought it here. And the answer may be hiding far beyond even government understanding. I don't think we have the science to understand the ET phenomenon yet. This 3D reality is a human condition. I don't think they're limited by this version of reality that we're experiencing. That's the reason that you see the craft just vanish. They, they pop in, they pop out of our reality. The director of NASA recently explained that we might be dealing with intelligences that we just can't comprehend. Maybe it's not a flesh and blood. Maybe it is a machine. Maybe it's an intelligent plasma. It's just a matter of time to get access to this data. We always make progress slowly. Until that day comes, researchers say there's other work we can do. Humanity has had a very difficult time with the concept of the other. We have uh, struggled with other cultures, other religions, and that has had violent results. Deadly results. So how do we mix in extraterrestrial species into the mix and expect that to go well? The world has to keep an open mind about this entire subject because very soon we are going to come up on events that are going to force the knowledge into our purview, whether we want it or not, of every single person on this planet. We have to listen to the witnesses and we cannot be afraid to listen to them. And we can't be afraid to look at the evidence. It's the biggest story in human history. And people need to get on board with it. And people need to dig in. On May 17th, 2022, the U.S. government takes a giant step toward widespread acceptance by holding its first public hearing on UFOs in more than 50 years. For too long, the stigma associated with UAPs has gotten in the way of good intelligence analysis. Today, we know better. Not only does the hearing confirm the 143 unidentified aerial phenomena released in the Pentagon report, it suggests that there may be hundreds more. We want to know what's out there as much as you want to know what's out there. But even with video evidence of these mysterious aircrafts, government officials have yet to come to any solid conclusions. We've endeavored to bring an all-hands-on-deck approach uh, to, to better understand this phenomenon. There's rarely an easy answer. It takes considerable effort to understand what we're seeing uh, in the examples that we are able to collect. Still, this government program shows no signs of shutting down. And whatever research is uncovered, generations of UFO enthusiasts can now take comfort in knowing that at least Americans will be informed. It is also the responsibility of our government and this panel to share as much as we can with the American people, since excessive secrecy only breeds distrust and speculation. 
what we're seeing now is encouragement and investment and excitement in the public sector. The stigma is dying on this subject. Those UAPs videos and pictures, they do have an impact. It will change the way people see the universe and the place of human beings in, in our universe. It's redemption to all the people who said they've seen some things, redemption for the people who've been abducted, redemption for everybody who's been laughed at. It's now saying, see, I see, I see, I told you, we're not alone in this universe.